Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 718. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. Today's February 15th, 2022. All right, people, you're going to have to put your seatbelts on for this one. This is probably going to be the most unscripted, unscripted we've ever done. Because we sat down and George says, you know, Kevin, there's there's, there's not a lot of news out there. Yeah, we could do something. We'll make up something. No, we're not, we're not allowed to make up news. That's what CNN does and NBC. So we can't make up anything. Well, what do you want to do? Well, we could talk inside baseball. So for those of you who want to really know the inner workings of how we think, we're going to do a little bit of inside baseball Anglican style. But before we do that, George, how are you doing this week? I am frustrated. <laughs> uh, go to settlement on my house on the 1st of March, and the mortgage company has come back with more documentation requests that... Uh, will involve hours of coming through boxes in garages and maybe a trip to Philadelphia. And, oh my goodness, it's no, frustrating. I, it is, and I am where you are. I was at one point. Back when we were getting our mortgage back in Milford, we, we were gonna be in the flood plane. And so our bank said, tomorrow you're gonna get a mortgage. And tomorrow came and said, by the way, could you get more flood insurance? And we sat in that Motel 6 for 30 days, waiting for uh, all the I's and dotted T's and all that to come forward. So Bank of America be happy, George. So I know this, this stress you're going through right now. Kevin, I remember that. And one of the first things I did when we started this is I prepaid a year's flood insurance. Good. So that was that box was firmly checked off on the list. So even... I don't even own the darn house. <laughs> if, if, the, if, the, if the waters rise and uh, the hurricanes come, I'm covered for something I don't own. Oh, my. So if you, if you hear the voice at the night going, Noah, Ooh, it's coming. <laughs> All right. So let's move on to talk about kind of the inside baseball of, you know, Anglican TV is known for going to events around the world. We've gone to the Lambus, we've done the Gafcons, we've done uh, Diocesan events, we've done national events here in America. Uh, I like to say that I've been to every continent except Antarctica in the last 15 years. And you know, nowadays there's not as much need for video coverage because most places live stream over the internet um, by themselves uh, using their own equipment or rented equipment, so I don't have to do it. What I did was unique and um, fun and new 15 years ago. Now everybody can do it. So George was saying, you know, Kevin, do we have to go to this next Lambeth? And I'm like, well, let's talk about it, George. Why would we go to Lambeth? Well, because we've been to the previous two. I've been to the previous two. We went to the last one with our cameras and our mm -hmm. microphones. Uh, 98 was great. 98 was great. You had total unfettered access. Uh, you'd eat, uh, you'd sleep in the same uh, buildings as the, uh, the bishops. Uh, there was an all, there was basically a hospitality building for the uh, AAC and its allies. And a lot of strategy took, strategy took place. And I was in, I was uh, conscripted to be a typist. Uh, I was the one who typed out the Lambeth 110 resolution. Um, that was great. 2008, new team and at, at running the show, and they put up well, all these fences. But, but, but back up, that previous Lambeth 98 was very successful for the conservatives, for the Orthodox yeah. who wanted to, to have a voice. They finally got their voice at that Lambeth. And I think that was an embarrassment to the Anglican Communion and to the Church of England, and they said, we're not doing that anymore. Yeah, at, see, in 98, there basically arose a parallel administrative and secretarial strat structure for the traditionalists, the Americans, uh, the conservative Americans, the Sydney Fellows, uh, South Americans, the Africans, 
had their own team of uh, people running to, everything from running to get Chinese food in the middle of the night to mm -hmm. typing stuff to basically answering factual questions about well if we do how did how do you do this from Robert's rules of orders and so the end result was a very successful Lambeth 98 for the conservative side as you say Kevin the 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 machine learned from the mistakes they made 10 years earlier in 2008 and shut off access completely um, we couldn't eat with the bishops. We couldn't socialize with the bishops because they're behind fences. And most of, I hate to say this, but most of our time was basically spent talking to each other in the press corps. What do you know? What do you know? Yeah, there's 20 people sitting at the in the press corps tables. And you know, if you went upstairs, you'd go to a little cafe and get some uh, uh, chips and fish. But other than fish and chips, sorry, guys wasn't English enough for you and so uh, in doing so we just had to learn that we were not going to get the good interviews unless you could uh, get in contact with somebody to talk to somebody to get a hold of the guy who had the cell phone for the bishop and maybe you could meet somewhere you know in the parking lot and conduct an interview yeah I mean I talked they had these chain link fence and I talked to bishops through the fence mm -hmm. uh, I remember talking to John Howe through a chain link fence and talking to some of the African bishops who I knew mm -hmm. um, from 98 and who knew me from get all, all this stuff. Um, what, if anything, it's gotten worse in recent years, the restrictions and the quietness. Now, in 2008, it was free flowing. Uh, people basically, the agenda was set, but the bishops by popular vote could change the agenda and take it directions they wanted to take it. 2008, Rowan Williams turned it into basically a graduate seminar where you uh, basically, professor uh, allows you to talk out the topic, but it's designed so that no resolution is reached. We call that in DABA, where the, yeah. you'd gather and, in groups and there would be a topic and you could talk and talk and talk about it, but not make a decision about that topic. Now, we've got a hint because the Lambeth Conference has been putting out these video conferences and uh, website classes for the bishops. And it's now being transformed once again to a uh, basically a social event where we have good listening and we meet and it, it's more it's become from a basically a parliament of bishops it's become a sort of national geographic type gathering a world council or a world assembly so you can look at the exotic costumes of the wives of the bishops from chile or mm -hmm. or korea and whatnot there is no it's certainly not a synod in the sense of the Catholic Church Synod of Bishops. It's certainly not a Vatican II type thing. Um, remember, Kevin, when we were when in, we went to a hotel in Alexandria, Egypt, uh, where the primates were meeting. And you and I would sit in the lobby because they didn't let us into the deliberations, of course. But after the, after the meetings broke, our friends, and they were friends. Uh, Still are. <laughs> I'm thinking like if Henry Arambi would sit down and tell us what had gone on. And then Henry Arambi said, I really want to be able to have an out and out discussion on homosexuality, where we basically lay out both. And I want to have an honest discussion where I hear Gene Robinson's full arguments. Let him marshal his evidence. And we will have a true indaba where we'll discuss the issue and not dance around it. Well, ever since that time, ever since uh, Dar es Salaam, when the bishops, based, the primates said, the American church has to repent and here's how they're going to do it. Rowan Williams, you do it. Ever since that time, the, 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 the machinery has, decide, has tried time and again to prevent any decision, to prevent anything. Well, and, to, to prevent accountability. And DABA mm -hmm. was set up that we will talk and we will listen, but we will not hold each other accountable because that's shameful for Christians to do, obviously. And we, we certainly, Dar es Salaam, they showed up here for the House of Bishops in uh, uh, Louisiana. 
That's right. Yeah. Nothing happened. New Orleans. Yeah. New Orleans. And, you know, it, we just reached this point where are Kevin and George going to fly to Lambeth or fly to another uh, primates gathering or meeting where they're not allowed to make decisions and they're not allowed to have accountability amongst each other? They're not even allowed to teach uh, amongst each other anymore. So, you know, w what would the, the point be for us to go? I, under the current conditions, I can't justify raising money to go to Lambeth. I could have gaffed on you know, no, if we're talking about money for Lambeth, it's probably talking three to four thousand a piece, mm -hmm. because the Lambeth people charge you. You know, they not charge access. England is very expensive uh, for accommodation, is, food, yeah. travel. Right. Um, now, I like to Kevin films. I like to take still photos, and we're in mass time. What you know? What is the historical long-term significance? of a photo of six late middle-aged men from Africa wearing masks who you can't tell apart. No. Uh, I mean, it, 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 for, in other words, there's no, uh, you know, whenever we, it's one of the great things is uh, every time the Archbishop of South Africa, Tabo Makoba, comes into the news, I've got a collection of a dozen photos I've taken of him over the years that I can put pull out that is appropriate. Tabo uh, is preaching from a pulpit. Tabo addressing a group of people. Tabo looking Episcopal. Tabo looking goofy. In other words, I've got all that because I was there to take the photos. Now I'm behind a fence. They've got masks on and they have minders keeping. It's it's like the Chinese, the way the Chinese are treating the press at the Olympics right now in Peking of just, you know, making their lives difficult. Now, the other thing is, we don't quite know who is going and who is not going to Lambeth. See, Lambeth, there will be some Kenyans going, for instance. Is the uh, primate Jackson Ole Sapit going? We don't know. Nigerians aren't going, Ugandans aren't going, Rwandans aren't going, Sydney's not going, Kenyans may be going. South Sudanese are going, the Congolese are going, and here's the problem, and we're now talking human nature. These guys who are our, fr who are our natural, if you will, friends or allies mm -hmm. are going to something where their other friends aren't going. Are they really want to going to talk to George and Kevin, uh, who they see in other circles? It's like you see, you see a friend who's... Uh, dating some who's and his wife in a restaurant and the next night you see your friend in it with in a restaurant with another woman who's not his wife is he going to want you to come up and say hello at the table no he's not and we run into that problem at these sort of things when the africans who know they're being bought they're not dumb but it's fun to have an all-expense paid trip paid by trinity wall street for you to go to England for two weeks to get tea at Buckingham Palace, uh, to go through... I mean, it's an exciting junket. Who, no, I, I who would wouldn't go. want to do that? I, I, and they, when you know in advance... When you know in advance... Was, if, if Justin Welby, <sighs> Archbishop of Canterbury, called me and said, Kevin, I'm going to fly you over to for the, for the junket we're having here at Lambeth, would that be fun? Would that be something you're interested in? Uh, yes, I would even you know re report nicely on your news. I could be bought off, but yeah. You know. And and the other thing is when the when the there's so many new bishops. There's always going to be new bishops, but the cultural me the historical memory of these things is absent from the vast majority of participants. So by the end of the meeting, they'll realize they've been snookered and had and been basically trotted out to. Uh, for photo opportunities, but they have no real influence or voice, they'll get angry. Well, guess what? They were angry in 2008 when that happened. Yeah. They're angry after every primates meeting when that happens because the true voices of the primates aren't allowed to speak at the press conferences. It's the carefully selected, you know, people in the pocket of Justin Welby. Well, now speaking so, of that, they're having a, a primates meeting coming up. They're going to gather uh, in England and have their meeting. Who's going? I haven't seen a list yet. Have you seen a list who's going yet? No, and they won't give us a list. That uh, 
that was one of the game. Uh, I remember in 2008, they had the lie. They wouldn't tell it. 1998, we knew exactly who was there. They gave us a list and who wasn't. 2008, they refused to give us the list because there were boycotts. Mm-hmm. And I was able to figure it out by basically counting heads Math. and identifying yep. everybody. In other words, who is that? Who is that? Who is that? Who is that? And I basically figured it out. And they told me they could not tell me because of the data protection laws in England. You know, oh, come on. Uh, but the primates meeting was originally going to be set to be held at the Anglican Center in Rome. Uh, and this was basically going to be exciting for a lot of the primates, the Gafcon type primates, as well as the new primates, because they'd never been to Rome before. They get to see the sites, have an audience with the Pope, do their business in the Rome, and they get to feel important and whatnot. And Justin Welby can uh, sort of flannel them along. Now it's because of COVID problems and Italian passport rules. Uh, They're going to have to have it in England and they're going to have it in London. And, you know, once you've been to London once or twice, and if you don't have any money, you don't need to go back again because (laughs) London is a horrendously expensive (laughs) city. It is. No, but I enjoy London. London's a lot of fun, especially taking a little taxi around town uh, and going to the train stations. Uh, I'd fly into London and, and take the high-speed train out to Canterbury to Kent. A lot of fun. Well, we'll have primates who've not been to meetings before who want to meet the other boys. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll have uh, those who say, well, I should participate at this level, but not at the Lambeth level. And there's no pre-published agenda that we are aware of that has discussion of meaningful things has it been leaked to us yet now if well here's our email addresses right here at the at the bottom screen if you want to send us the agenda that'd be great but you know that's one of the big problems because i'm looking now we're post-covid sooner or later gafgun is going to restart they're going to have their kigali uh, conferences again that would be something i'm more interested to go to because people there are making very good decisions they're holding each other accountable they're growing the church and they're providing uh, a way forward for the persecuted church and and the gafcon meetings have never been uh scripted or staged well uh, they have an agenda <clears throat> yeah. well they have an agenda but we but have it's a, not we have access to everybody there unless this unless they're a persecuted christian who an interview would endanger them uh, I mean, the, the, I, I liken the Lambeth, the last Lambeth, and from what I can tell about the next Lambeth, to like the meetings of the uh, uh, Soviet Party Congresses in, in, old, in the olden days of the Soviet Union, where you all <laughs> clap together, and we have speeches from the dear leader, mm-hmm. and everything is accomplished behind doors by the Central Committee, and the people are just trotted out to... To, uh, sort of give local color to the thing. Mm-hmm. Um, the films are nice for historical purposes, but the action has all al- the decisions have already been taken ahead of time. The action's already done, and that's the difference with GAFCON: is the decisions and the actions are really done on site, and you have complete unfettered access. Now we always get new anal retentive press people each of these meetings who don't, you know, know us and have, you know, never left their country before, and so they don't understand how the games are played. But you know, by the end of the meeting, they sort of figured it out. Um, but yeah, go into Gafcon, go into a Kigali type conference. That's worth the time. Mm-hmm. However, you remember you went to that uh, Kappa meeting in. In Uganda, that was basically scripted by Trinity Wall Street, and it was a mosquito net. Yeah, that was a, a mosquito net conference. Uh, I did get to meet the the president of Uganda, which is kind of fun. But uh, um, it it is what it is. You know, the, it was called the All Africa Meeting, and it was more of a UN type uh, meeting than it was a uh, Grow the Church meeting. It is what it is. They, they paid my plane ticket, they got some great footage, 
and it was live streamed to the world, something that uh, very few people could do at that time. Now everybody's doing it. Now, one of the things that has arisen as technologies change is the phenomena of blocking bishops. Mm -hmm. um, we've had bishops at these closed door meetings or private meetings take to the internet after the meeting's over. Uh, now, Dan Martin was famous for this. He would basically have a stream of conscious report on Dan Martin, the retired Bishop of Springfield. Now, the problem is you have to consider the source each time because sometimes mm -hmm. somebody can be in the room and participate and still not have a clue what happened. Um, so you can't just re recast what they've said. You have to sort of know the source and mm -hmm. compare it to other events. Uh, I'll give you an... Uh, where I'm going with this is that uh, Paul Bays, who's the Bishop of Liverpool, he's about to retire, or he retired on Sunday, yeah. has all of a sudden been in the press. Uh, he's recently said, I don't want to be in a church when I die that doesn't allow gay marriage. Uh, he recently tore into Prime Minister Boris Johnson in England for saying something uh, cutting against the uh, Labour Party leader, um, implying that when the Labour Party leader was the chief of public prosecutions, he declined to uh, aggressively pursue a pedophile, a celebrity pedophile, Jimmy Savile. I don't know if that's true or not. I don't follow that sort of British news. But Paul Bayes weighed into Boris Johnson as a horrible human being for that. Now, where the hell has he been all these years? Well, he's been in the British House of Bishops, which teaches the Omerta code of silence. <laughs> Extremely silent. Yeah. And now, and so in the past, that Ome the bit the bishops were peers of one another. Mm -hmm. Now, they have that generation brought in by the machine at church house over the past 20 years are company men and women very few uh mavericks no mavericks very few interesting characters uh just very bland managers uh people without any parish experience whatsoever um there was well, one eastern English diocese that had appointed a, a woman suffragan who had you know, maybe two years of parish experience, but 10 or 15 years of running a social work organization. Ideal bishop material. <laughs> and for me, that's, that, that's hysterically funny because that person wouldn't get hired as an assistant in a decent American parish. Well, contrast yeah, that's the that. model of the bishop. Sure. But if you contrast that to how the bishops, bishops were in the late 90s and early 2000s, they all had blogs. They were all talking about the issues that were happening at the um, House of Bishops level here in the Episcopal Church. And uh, you certainly saw Church of England, uh, College of Bishops, and Synod News. News. Uh, they, would, they would post. Not all of them, but the ones who had opinions that were not being uh, heard in the Synod were being heard outside the Synod, for sure. And you don't see any of that. There's been a complete shutdown at the Episcopal Church level and at the Church of England level as far as what a bishop is allowed to do or say in public. Now, this is going to come across badly, and I expect we'll be, I'll be, you, I'll be attacked, and Kevin will probably get some of the blowback. I'll get a little flack. But I've talked to bishops about these issues. And I too have, I've been invited to stand for election as bishop in three dioceses and started the process in one before I withdrew. And what I was told was that, George, your voice, yours and Kevin's voices are so much more powerful than mine as a bishop. Uh, if you want to talk, if you became a bishop, you basically lose your voice. Hmm. Um, and there are people who blog for vanity purposes, but look at Justin Welby. When he puts out a video, he gets four or 500 views. Um, the, where, I guess where I'm going with this is, is that we're seeing a shift where people like George and Kevin have a larger audience and a larger reach than the hierarchical leaders. And so there are more people out there who are investing their time and energies in blogging rather than trying to climb the greasy pole because they seek 
something that if they're successful at what we do, or if they're a writer or a blogger or something, that in the past could only be achieved if you became a bishop. Mm -hmm. Am I making any sense? Or? You are, because you have identified the need for something like unscripted. We are completely unscripted as far as the news we deliver, what we talk about, the transparency in the level. If there's a bad GAFCON story, I have to report it. We'll talk about it. If there's a bad Lambus story, of course, we'll talk about it. If there's good stories, we talk about as well. But having that nature that you know when you turn into this program, you're going to hear people who are extremely biased in what we believe, but we give you both sides of the story. There, there, we, we, we don't white coat the fence on either side here. Y you have to hear what we say, and that's why the numbers you know, grow 20% per year in our viewership. It, I'm astounded by it. Uh, I know that we're, the church is completely broken because a show like Anglican Unscripted can succeed in it. And two guys should not be able to sit, sit down in front of web cameras and have this type of influence on a church if the church is healthy. Shouldn't happen. It, it, and when I write something, or when we published uh, some uh, really well thoughtful articles, one on has Acne gone Lutheran in its discussion of uh, Holy Communion, or uh, should we have multiple cups of communion or a single chalice? Mm -hmm. Those articles get, by a factor of 10, distribution to interested Episcopalians over anything a bishop says in a his letter to a parish or diocese. In other words, the, the, the megaphone, the trumpet, the, the TV screen is no longer the diocese or the national church in its communications. It's uh, things, it, it's this new technology. Now, Kevin and I are fast approaching, approaching antiquity, and there's going to be newcomers <laughs> rising and new technologies and new Silver. ways of doing things. Yeah. You know, it's like one of the, you know, my children are on Facebook solely to keep track of their parents. But what, the, because Facebook what? is now middle aged, it, it is, is a middle, it, Facebook is, you know, that's why the stock I think is tanking. Facebook is not growing anymore because there are other technologies that are supplanting it among the younger population. Well, so now it's also, George and Susan and their children watch, make sure they're not embarrassed by baby pictures. But Facebook is also deep platform conservative news. If the mm -hmm. Bad Bomb B has an article out there, um, they're getting six views instead of 300,000 views. Uh, they're a normal mm -hmm. thing. When I put a, a link to like Powerline blog dot, you know, so, and hey, read this article, six people like it. Well, I know that's not right because I have 3,000 people where a year ago, if I had put that same article up, there'd be three or 400 people liking it. Uh, all conservatives like me are allowed to post now are pictures and mm -hmm. um, that, that are not, not deplatformed. So you'll see a meme once in a while, a meme, sorry, once in a while that I'll post that's conservative. But I largely only post, I used to post like once or twice a day on Facebook. I'm down to my, twice a week. And that's the difference. That's why the stock is tanking. They deplatformed people like myself and people like the Babylon Bee um, from having a voice, from linking to stories that interest us. It's sad. Now, I personally adopted of uh, uh, I'm non-political. I'm non-controversial on Facebook because mm -hmm. people because I tie it into parish life, and a parish priest has to stay clear from politics. He has to focus, focus, focus on the spiritual. So my Facebook platform is family photos, the occasional interesting article about biblical history or archaeology or art, and worship services. Um, I, but I set up an account on uh, uh, Parler. And after Parler was shut down by Amazon, was it Amazon who shut them down or... Whoever yeah, they were on the AWS down. servers. They got shut down there, and they went to Microsoft. Microsoft said, no way, Jose. So, you know. But after so. Parler was shut down, uh, basically the gap was so long that basically the whole thing fell apart, mm -hmm. and it's not what it once was. Now, the problem is, now I don't want to say problem, but uh, Donald Trump is starting his own vehicle when he has uh, Congressman Devin Nunez as a CEO. And I think that'll be great for conservative speech, but... 
we don't quite fit into that yeah. template because we're actually liberals on some issues and we're, we're conservatives on most issues, but we would not be viewed as squeaky clean because we're bleeding heart Christians, liberals on some other issues. You, you, so there's not point, really a... We do, we fit it, we fit the definition of liberal, we fit the definition of libertarian, and we fit the definition of conservative. It depends on the topic. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. So that the... But then we ask the question, Kevin and I keep going, how big is our potential market? Yes, there are 80 million Anglicans. Uh, <laughs> <And> yeah. <laughs> but just like, um, like the Episcopal News Service, which they put a great deal of money into, they have a great number, of, not great number, but they have several paid staffers. Mm -hmm. uh, they fly them to all the different meetings by and large, the Episcopal News Service's reach is roughly akin to ours. Um, different markets, of course, different and we markets. will reprint. We will reprint Episcopal News Service articles that are worthy of being reprinted, or of interest, or set out the liberals' position. But the point is, the Episcopal News Service has topped out their market. Um, and recently, the last year, the Anglican Communion News Service did a huge pullback, uh, stopped posting every day three four times to once a week little digest of uh, press releases from the home office. And the reason why they did that was partially financial. They wanted to cut down on their staffing. But they sort of realized that their market um, is, is finite. Even though there are 80 million of them, for, they've not been able to find a way to reach that niche. So have we discovered the answer? No, because neither Kevin or I are paid. We don't get any income from this. We don't advertise to speak of. I mean, we have small advertising, um, basically but, for friends, friendly sites. But that's the difference. I mean, we developed this audience over 15 years. You, you, the viewer who are coming here, most of you are long timers. You've been with us since episode one. Uh, Thirty percent of you have, and that's just amazing. And uh, much more, ninety percent have been with us at least uh, eighty-five, seventy-five percent of the way, according to Google statistics. In as such, we haven't had to change a lot of how unscripted works. If we were going to start again today, and we wanted to do it in the TikTok world, where you do two to three-minute videos, we, George and I would have to have a different topic video for what happens to the news. So each week would be five different unscripted that go two or three minutes each because that's the attention span of the newer audience, the newer generation. When my kids are on uh, video formats, they're not watching, what are we up to, 33 minute videos? Not a chance. They don't have that attention span. They can't sit through a Super Bowl. They can't sit through a baseball game. They can't sit through the stuff that uh, the Gen Xers and the boomers could. Um, it's it's a completely different mentality of how long you get their attention span because lo and behold they, they heard something they just want to check it real quick up oh, yep I, I'll, I'll answer that later or they'll answer right in front of you yeah can we continue this this interview for my next job in a second here I need to answer an email and so it's just a different way people think now and are accustomed to all this different influence in, in communication and where they're being influenced you guys, thankfully, will sit through 45 minutes of Kevin and George, 80% of you, according to Google, sit through the whole program. That's crazy. I can't, I don't have the attention span for unscripted. George, do you? Yes. Uh, but because I've trained myself. Yeah. Um, I've trained myself to have that. I enjoy longer podcasts. Um it's easier for me to listen to a long podcast than it is to a long video. Mm -hmm. So I subscribe to a number of podcasts that are 45 minutes, an hour, hour and a half, no problem. If I had, I don't, but to have to sit and take the time to watch, uh, that's a special event in my day. Yeah. I don't do that uh, for everything. So we're very conscious that the people who do watch us for the half hour, 45 minutes, an hour at times, they're basically making a sacrifice that is unusual in this culture. And that, I, 
I think I want people to hear the gratitude I have for the kindness that people have of speaking to us. And that's why we read every single comment. Yeah. That's why we respond when it's appropriate to the comments, because we, we realize um, that people are investing in us, investing of their time. Now, um, you know, for instance, I think it's Cottrell rather than Co uh, Co uh, Cottrell or Co... Okay, we still don't know. Kevin, you, <laughs> no, I still don't know. I'm sorry. But the point is, this is, you know, I'm, I'm aware that there's an American pronunciation based on our way we speak. And Phonics, yep. the, there's the proper way, the American way, and then the way the people in England do it. Mm -hmm. Susan and I watched a Netflix drama show called uh, it was a Prey, a British crime drama from the five, six years ago. I'm so glad we had closed captioning because we needed <laughs> we needed uh, uh, subtitles because we couldn't understand the English people in this movie uh, because they are from Manchester, I think, and I couldn't understand the accents. But that being silly, I'm being said. No, but no, it, it's, it's, a, what, but it, hold, it's the same here in North America. Root or route? I'm in the RV world. I need to know which one's correct. And, you know, I'm going to take Route 66 or Route 66. It's hard for fanatics. Yeah. But if uh, Kevin, we need to follow Nat King Cole and say, get your kicks on Route 66, 66 not yes. Route 66. <laughs> but the what, this changing world, part of it is, is as I've gotten older and what, maybe hopefully wiser in the ministry, some of the issues that I was really animated about as a younger priest, human sexuality, um, abortion. I mean, I still hold the same general moral views, but the fire in me is not as powerful because I've moved to a different place where I think the major problem facing our country and our nation and the world is addiction. Drugs, sex, uh, computers. In other words, they're good addictions and bad addictions. Um, I have an addiction to the daily offices because it's just been a fixed part of my life. That's a good thing. I also have an addiction to bad food. Um, I have friends with addictions to cigarettes. But, yeah. but the point is that, I don't want to sound airy-fairy, but the work of the church really is at this point in, a, in changing people's addictions, which as human beings are going to have from destructive ones to to life enriching and changing ones, which I believe is Jesus Christ. No, I'm not calling Christ an addiction, but the way the brain works, uh, it evolves and it's different. So that, I mean, as a child, I remember my father at the breakfast table reading the paper. And before, as my mother, as, as dinner was being prepared, he'd sit down at the table and read the evening paper. I don't know anybody who, I mean, few cities have two papers nowadays evening and morning yeah. but his his worldview was was the newspapers mine was television and beginnings of the internet my children as you say TikTok or instagram or whatever whatever, whatever i don't even know the names of the stuff how we tech on information i found that as a preacher um i have to be visual and animated and I, so I can go a half hour, but I have to be almost dramatic in the presentation so that people enter into the life of the sermon because of the way we have trained people to gather information because of, you know, the addiction, the brain, how the brain flows and processes. Well, so, I, well let's just quickly talk about how news has changed in the last 30, 40 years as well. News is no longer the way it used to be where you could read a two-sided story, where every issue had at least two sides, and you got to find out what both sides thought, not just what the journalist thought about the topic. And that has changed so much, especially in the last eight years where journalism has become so politicized. And so biased to the point where um, here in America, it's propaganda. They're making up stories and fake stories for the side they support. 
and they're avoiding news um, which people need to know about. Uh, there were riots in Minneapolis on Friday. Antifa got together, shut down a whole suburb of Minneapolis uh, and burned businesses, did um, graffiti, did all the stuff they do, stop traffic, um, frighten people. Star Tribune didn't print anything about it. It's the, the lead newspaper of uh, St. Paul, Minneapolis. Not a word, because they didn't want to start anything. We, you know, criminality to a certain degree is allowed in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and in Chicago, and in Los, uh, Los Angeles, and New York City. Things have changed. What they used to love to report on, they don't report on anymore at all. So it's not just the bias, it's the lack of reporting. And that's become dangerous. A, of, of the husband, who's an, an acquaintance of mine, a friend of ours, uh, Molly Hemingway's husband. Molly mm -hmm. Hemingway is a contributor on Fox News and is the editor of The Federalist. Uh, we've been acquainted with her, I've been acquainted with her Long 10, time, 15 yeah. years. Yeah, she did get religion she and famous. she's done an episode of Unscripted. Um, her husband, Mark, uh, wrote an article, and Mark uh, is a little older. He's our age. Molly's mm. a little younger. Mark wrote an article recently. Uh, he said, you know, he, he entered the journalism straight out of college with a journalism degree from the University of Oregon. And he has since worked on three newspaper, uh, two, three magazines, two newspapers, and a wire service. And when he started, he went to work uh, for uh, at a newspaper where his editor started off at the age of 16 as a copy boy and rose over time, over 30 years, to become the editor uh, of the newspaper, being a reporter and doing all this and that. And the newspaper world was drew its reporters primarily from the working class, middle class, as a hard road up and so that the news so that reporters had an experience of life that's completely gone now the newspapers have these and the tv shows have these young college graduates uh, six seven eight years out of school uh who basically have degrees in liberal you know make work degrees <laughs> so, and get jobs, justice degrees yes and get and get jobs through uh nepotism Mm -hmm. and through connections and basically are ignorant people and have not learned the art of being able to hear both sides and part of this um we have a friend stephen bates who retired recently from the guardian and stephen was a very liberal reporter mm -hmm. but he was an oxford graduate uh so he's a very bright man and he went to work for a newspaper in reading in england and he started off uh basically doing the crime beat and local city government. And he ended up spending 25 years in The Guardian as one of their major reporters. But when you start with the little stuff, you have to do both sides of a, a, uh, a crime story. You have to do both sides of the city councils fighting over whether or not to put in a uh, sidewalk in this part of the thing. Now we have reporters who skip all that, skip all the training about how it's done properly and are basically brought in to an organization like CNN uh, where they're basically told this is the story we're covering by the editor and this is how we want it covered. Well, uh, Don't but, go out and find the news, write this, write this opinion piece. Every story from CNN, NBC, Fox News, every, every major media is now a good versus evil story. Mm -hmm. You know, it's no longer a two-sided story. Back... <laughs> 1984, when I graduated high school, long time ago. Oh, man, we're agent. A, a story I would read in a newspaper had the first paragraph was an outline. Uh, 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 you know, this is what the story is about. Second paragraph, this is one side of the story. Third paragraph, this is the other side of the story. Fourth paragraph, a summation of the, 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 the preceding three paragraphs. That was a standard newspaper article. And you find them all over. You know, except for the tea garden. Tea garden, that, there's no two sides of that. You know, but anytime there was a, a good story you wanted to read about in, in the newspaper, you had four paragraphs well outlined. That's not so anymore. 
uh, mm-hmm. for you know, it's the evil, evil conservative Republican uh, state senator did this. The um, saint, unholy, holy uh, from the the Justice League, helped save the day. That type of thing, and it's it's just so much different now, George. George, for forty five minutes now, we've had a big Seinfeld episode. <laughs> Let's finish this off. So um, why don't you guys put into uh, the comments why we should or should not go to Lamborth or attend other things. They're live streamed anyway. I can Zoom anybody and get an interview if they will talk to me uh, during Lambeth and GAFCON. But if you really th- feel compelled that we would do better at the Lambeths and attending these, let us know. Uh, and then we'll talk about fundraising, but we have a little time before that. I want to thank you for watching this special episode of Anglican Unscripted. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. Today is February 15th. No, yes it is, but it's actually 700, episode 718 of Anglican Unscripted. <laughs>